Mary Ann Corbier, and she, she thinks the way things are going right now, that it's actually the people that are literate in Nishnab Emwin that are going to be the ones that will uh, be able to perpetuate it and pass it on. On the one hand, people want to emphasize the oral sea, the orality of our language. And of course that's important and that's what's needed. But what just doesn't seem to be happening is people that are fluent right now, that are of childbearing age, still, the majority still have not been able to make that the language of their home and to make it a natural transmission of language and knowledge and culture in the home. So what ends up happening is that is the the language isn't passed on but the cultural protocols and cultural knowledge is transmitted in English naturally in the home as well as in the community to a certain extent and to uh, through different programs. So one of the things that I that I've seen one of my other teachers used to always say when when I was um, when I was a, a Shkabe, it was, uh this guy had died, has died now maybe ten at least ten years ago now. Anyway, he would say um, of the work we were doing, this is not a program. And I never really used to understand what he was what he was getting at. I, like, but here, what had happened were people were coming to the ceremony, and it was part of their program to fulfill their program, uh, whatever they were in. Let's say they were in a justice circle, and that was part of the program was for them to serve as, uh, time there. Or they were on uh, OW, I don't know if it's still called OW, and, and part of their, get their hours, or to just go there and uh, help out at the ceremony. And then, uh, so I, I was I was like, is that what he's talking about? That this really isn't a program. Uh, that really, it's the people that are to lead it and that aren't, aren't program people. But I see now increasingly, which is a good thing that actually has to happen, is that uh, a lot of these programs have funding and they're funded. Yet on the, the other hand, it's uh, when it becomes your paid job per se, it seems that uh, there's an element of, I don't know, if you're getting overtime for, for healing work, ceremonial work, something seems amiss to me. But he never said it that way. So anyway, it just made me think that we're making a lot of stuff into programs rather than, rather than what he would always say is practicing to be good, practicing to do your best uh, to be a Nishinaabe. And what he used to say, Gijaya Nishinaabe, kind-hearted Nishinaabe. So there's, uh, there's those that he, he wanted uh, people to, to believe, and he would say, try and believe that. And that was the, the hard part, is really believing it and uh, keeping it. But if you're on a program, then you it kind of relieves some of that belief. Because if you're getting paid to be there, you're going to show up. That's what I think he was getting at, was that if they're paying them to show up and they show up, and then they're done their hours, then they don't bother coming in. Let's say this used to be, a, well, it is a four-day ceremony that we, we were doing. And then, you know, they, they did their hours the first two days, then they don't bother coming back the next two. And it's because they're, they're on a program. So I, I can see on the one hand that that's, there's, there's basically pluses and minuses, pros and cons to everything. So when I see this, the, the amount of programs that are made and over uh, this whole area, I see that uh, maybe some of the belief is uh, is being uh, diminished, in a sense, because of that sacrifice, isn't really there per se. So I see that with education too, is basically where I worked at Lakeview School. We were making these program, uh, we were recording the elders, and then we were also translating different documents into Nishnabemwin, and 
earlier I had problems with translating things from English into Nishnabe when especially if it were done very literally. But on the other hand, you got to realize that uh, our language and our culture are always changing. Although some people say, I've heard different people, speakers say that they speak the way they spoke, the way our ancestors spoke 500 years ago, which of course to me is impossible. But uh, that's what they assert, that they speak the, the true Nishnab Emwin and uh, others don't. And so that's the, the other part is this whole competition or of, of dialects and dialect affinity and which one is the purest and, and that kind of thing. And it's... Uh, it, to me, it's not really. It shouldn't really be about that, but it is. Likewise, uh, the the stories when we move into written forms, it, the, the the you can see this. Uh, this actually happened with the Bible. The Bible was a an oral tradition, a collection of oral tradition stories, and then uh, there were variations of those stories. And then somebody had set them down and then said, this now is the word, this is the book. And so, and then after that, King James apparently was the one that gave it also a royal decree. They put them all together to make them into one. So I see that happening with, uh, like, the Mishomas book. And of course, that uh, to me, what Eddie Benton was able to accomplish with revitalizing the, the Medewin is... Uh, just awesome. He really helped out a lot of people. And then also with that book, a lot of people use that book. But the thing is, when we have just one book like that, you, you end up uh, silencing other stories. So to me, instead of relying on one book, we got to actually look at more of these stories and put more stories to it and try to prevent this uh, kind of Mishoma's book becoming the next Bible, in a sense. So we have uh, Basil Johnson, of course, did a lot of great work as well. But I still don't see, as, especially at Lakeview, I didn't see how stu uh, teachers were using those in their curriculum. And it just seemed like everyone wants to remake their, their materials, which is fine, I guess, because what that really shows is you, you are, as a teacher, you have, you're trying to understand it yourself. And if you understand it yourself, you make or remake it in your own design. But if you just implement it, maybe you're not really fully understanding it and you're just delivering it. So I see the need to do that in, on the one hand. So this, uh, I was just reading this book uh, this morning actually uh, by Pat Ningawas, Ginata Atazoke. And it was about the stories her grandmother, I mean her mother told her. And she wrote them down in uh, Nishnabe when this Pat was. And uh, she's from Lak Suo. Anyway, it was really funny. The story was actually titled uh, Nanabojo Kwe Kazo Gabane, when Nanabush pretended to be a woman. And it's a famous episode told all over. But when I started reading it, I never saw it actually. This one was actually, this version was actually started off with the famous version of the Shaddai dance that they call, where Nanabush tricks those uh, ducks to come and dance in a lodge, and then he ends up breaking their necks, and, and then he ends up cooking them. So I, I laughed at this version because usually, the uh, in all the versions, Nanabush tells his ass to keep a watch out. He says, Kawabin, keep a watch out. If anybody comes, wake me up. And so usually it's uh, the, the kids like this story because then Nanabush's ass is just farting to, wait, to try and wake him up and he farts louder and louder. But in this version that Pat, uh, Pat's mom told, there's a sidebar. She, Pat ends up assuming the role of her mom as uh, the narrator because the story is going along and then the, the mother says, Nanabush told his, his bum to wake him up. So his, he was talking to his bum, and his bum said, yeah, I will do that. And then, then the mother, but uh, it's actually Pat, of course, says, I wonder how his ass sounded when he talked. So it, it made it sound like he really literally talked. So usual versions are, <coughs> the ass just farts. 
Anyway, then uh, the the actual the ass doesn't just fart. He says, "Hey, wake up, wake up!" To Nanbush. So Nanbush wakes up because he says, "The ass says there's people coming around the corner. I see them." So Nanabush wakes up and he looks over there and as he the people see Nanabush waking up, they hide around the corner again. So when Nanabush looks, there's nobody there. So he says to his ass, there's nobody there. And he says, no, there was somebody. And he says, ah, you. So he goes back to sleep. And then again, the, the ass says, hey, hey, there are people are coming. They see the, they see the duck. Uh, you put the ducks in the sand there. They see the fire. Nanabush wakes up again. He says, no, there's nobody there, you dumb ass. And then, he's, then he slaps his own ass. That was the funny part that I never seen or heard that version where Nanabush actually slaps his own ass. And I thought it was, it was just funny to... So that part uh, gets... The sequence of these stories always get told in different ways, depending on the storyteller. And the ones that I... I I learned from where there's William Jones texts, Ojibwe texts collected by William Jones, and he went to Boy Fort in Minnesota, as well as uh, Fort William in Ontario by uh, Lake Superior, and he recorded a fellow named John Benesse and Wase uh, Guneshkang, uh, the one who leaves his footprint shining in the snow, and then Medaso Ganj Tenkla, another of a fellow, and he also recorded a lady named Marie Saret, and this was around 1900. 1910. So those versions, are, he wrote them down in, in Nishnabe and then he translated them into English. So I always liked using those because they have, a, to me, a more authentic voice to them. And then I had to, uh, what they call, transliterate. So take that old orthography and write it into how we write now. So of course those episodes are in there as well, the, the shut eye dance and that. And then he, uh, Pat Ningawas sings the song that Nanabush sang there in the book. Like, uh, and all he's saying is in, the, in this song is, I bring, I bring a dance to you. I bring a dance to you. Now, the version I heard from, uh, that Anton Troyer recorded with uh, late uh, Mide leader Archie Mose about this song was uh, he sang the song too, but he made it, it was a different one. And it was Gego Navi Kegon. Don't look. Don't look. Gego Navi Kegon. Gego Navi Kegon. Gishpin. Gishpin. Mesko Shkijigwe. Gishpin. Mesko Shkijigwe. If you look, your eyes will turn red. So that's what the song Nanabush is singing at that time when all those ducks are in that lodge. And uh, so when, he, when he's doing that, Pat Ningwas has a different song, and R.G. Mose has another song, and then I have this other uh, recording, and uh, and it was it was put together by an uh, anthropologist named Thomas Venom, and he, he called it A uh, Hundred Years of Minnesota Ojibwe Music. And so he has on there these recordings that uh, Frances Densmore did, and Frances Densmore did a book called Chippewa Music, and she recorded a lot of uh, midday leaders at that time singing different songs and then uh, and then right up to uh, the 80s where you have uh, Keith Sakola's Indian car on there. Anyway, one of the songs is uh, as a fella singing that uh, Nanabush is singing to the ducks too and it's a different song. So th the point that I'm making is there's all these different variations but the main events are the same and that when we end up writing stuff down the good part is that you can see the variety, but what I see actually happening is that actually some people are starting to prefer that it's just one. I think they want to make one version. Nobody's ever come out and said this, but how they actually how it ends up being said is that's uh, well the way I heard it was this, which is usually the way it was done anyway. You, you just say this is the way I heard it, and you tell it. And so you add on to the story. But now it seems when it's being written, then it's like, no, this is the version. And then so others start saying, no, this is the version. But one of the things that I liked, I recorded a, a Chiging elder, Louis Debaske, talking about when he was a child. And it was at the sugar camp. And he says, at that time, 
those days, a storyteller would go around to all these sugar camps, and he would tell these stories. And he said that uh, their their payment for that was uh, food and uh, coarse syrup and whatever else. But they go to all these different sugar camps and they tell these stories. And he says they tell the one day they tell one story, next day they tell another, and then they come back third day and tell another. But then what they, the parents would do at, at that trigger camp is they would get their kids, now your turn to tell that, tell those stories. So that's how they were actually trained to tell those stories. And he says, but it was, it was always so fun and funny because all the kids took a turn and then he says, uh, I forget which one of his cousins always messed it all up. So it, was, it wasn't about <laughs> memorizing it rote. Like it wasn't reciting the uh, the rosary. It was actually trying to be outdo each other and tell the story the best. So they had they had what the, he, he called artistic license to tell these stories, to try and make the best story, the funniest one, but also to stay true to it. That's the that's the thing that's missing in our education right now. I think for our storytelling is that we actually. We'll get this, the kids, and this is a part of what I'm, I'm doing, but that we're at a chicken and egg thing, is we need people who tell those stories the way they used to, and then how you can actually mix and match episodes. So that's why I started off by telling uh, about Pat Ningawas' book that I was reading this morning, where it was about Nanabush Gi Kwe Kaza, pretending to be a woman. But it, that, that her version of that story actually started with the the shut eye dance and usually that's a standalone episode so anyway you, you fill those in you can put those in in any episode because that number story is really his life and you there's no actual chronological order to it anyway so you, you as a storyteller in the moment you can draw upon different episodes and tell them what we're doing now is we're teaching kids from books these stories and uh, that's that's good because they need to get the story first because nobody in their house is probably it's unlikely that anybody's telling them those stories in the home especially in Nishnab Emun. so then the next part is though that I think is that you'd add on other versions of those stories in lieu of having different storytellers come that's what I forgot to say that Lewis said then the next day a different storyteller would come and sometimes it would be the same story told a different way or another told, a, of course it's never told the exact same way. Anyway, so this idea of a, of an oral tradition where different storytellers are telling the same story but of course using their artistic license to do so is, uh, is and, but maintaining the integrity of the story is the, the main thing. So I've, I've seen and heard three documented uh, songs with that story. And of course, there must be, that may, just leads me to think there must be more versions of that song, that uh, Shut Eye Dance. Uh, anyway, it's, uh, that's the thing that we need to reincorporate in our teachings. And I read this one book, and it was an anthropologist who actually uh, wrote the intro to this book and I liked it what she had said was she actually said I'd actually like to make a book and uh, put all these stories the versions of this story in one book and your job as the story to I mean the reader is you have to go through and read all the versions and that's your first starting point rather than just reading the one version and then moving on to the next story or episode. They, 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 some, they, some call them episodes you know, of Nana Bush's life. Anyway, there's a... Uh, and then, of course, people are making new stories for that thing, for Nana Bush as well. So it's... There's just uh, this idea of using Nana Bush or Nana Bojo as the foundation, one of the foundations of that. But you, you do have to maintain some of the integrity of it. One of the things that I talk about that I haven't uh, 
talked about this in a while, was what I liked. You, if you read the uh, Mishoma's book, the flood happens because the people aren't living by their instructions. And uh, he's going to flood the world, cleanse the world. And uh, people don't like this when, uh, when you say, well, that sounds like the Bible. That the Bible says uh, the world was flooded because uh, you know, people weren't living to their instructions, and uh, and uh, the Creator, the, well, God had to cleanse the world, and that's what He did. So they don't like that. Like if you talk to uh, three fires people and you mention that, they're they're gonna put the hate on you. Eh? But if you actually look at all these other stories, you see that actually the story, the flood story, is actually tied to Nanabush and his wolf. And uh, it's in that Ojibwe text, but it's also in uh, uh, Paul Radden collected it, and then also a fellow named George Cabellose from Garden River told the story. And that story actually goes all the way out. And if you read a book uh, of stories, uh, I mean, a book called uh, Sacred Stories of the Sweetgrass Cree uh, by a linguist named, the linguist named Bloomfield collected it, uh, Plains Cree people. And they have the same version, but of course it's uh, Wisaki Jock and his wolf. And then the long and short of this story is basically the Nanabush gets this wolf and the wolf episode is in the Mishomas book too where Nanabush and the wolf and it's a bigger teaching that uh, that is conveyed in there about them two companions and then they they end up separating and they say that whatever happens to the wolf will happen to the Anishinaabe and you know so it's, it's a great teaching too. But in that uh, in, the, in these other versions collected, Nanabush loses his wolf and uh, he ends up having a dream that he says to the wolf, uh, if ever you're going to pass by water jump or jump in the water, throw in one of these sticks first. I had a bad dream that you were going to drown. So he gives him these sticks and so he says, even if it's just a little puddle, make sure you throw this stick in there. So one day Nanabush's uh, nephew, well the wolf, that's what he calls him, my nephew, is uh, chasing down a moose. And then that moose is, is uh, of course, running away. And then there's a, you could tell that it's a dried riverbed. It's a, all the way the rocks are that it's dried up. Anyway, so the moose runs across there and, the, and the, in that split second, the wolf decides it's dry so I don't need to throw the stick. So he jumps up to jump on the back of that moose. And as soon as he does that, and he didn't throw the stick, all this water comes rushing down, and it washes that uh, wolf away. So that's what happened, and uh, Nanabush's wolf gets uh, washed away. And then, so Nanabush is waiting for his uh, nephew to come back because the nephew was the hunter and uh, he cooked and everything. Nanabush had it made with this uh, wolf. So one night goes through and he's like, well, he'll be back in the morning. And he's waiting for him all the next day and he doesn't come. And then at night he's really worried and then he, he doesn't sleep that night. So that next morning he goes, looks for tracks. And then that's what he sees. He sees uh, moose tracks and the wolf tracks. And then he sees them both going into that big river. Then he knows what has happened. So he follows the course of that river. Then he gets to where that river mouth is, eh? And where that river mouth is, at that lake. And then that's where he sees the kingfisher. And the kingfisher is laughing away and just totally amused. And he says, what are you watching? And uh, he says, oh, all these nidok are playing a ball game with Nana Bush's nephew's head as the ball. So that wolf got killed. So this is what gets uh, Nana Bush wants to get revenge. So long and short of it is that this uh, uh, Gishkamansi, this kingfisher, says to Nana Bush, after Nana Bush tries to capture him, eh? anyway, he ends up uh, telling that bird was brown then, but he, Nana Bush tells him, I'll make you pretty like the sky, blue if you help me. So that bird tells them, they come out and sun themselves here every day when it's really hot. And the last one to come out will be the chief. And when he comes out, he'll lay right in the middle. And he says, but 
I'll give you, he gives him one of his uh, nails, his talons, kajin. And he says, uh, when you make your spear, make sure you stab him in his shadow, not in his body. And he says, because if you stab him in his body, you won't kill him. But if you stab him in the shadow, you'll kill him. Anyway, so he ends up, of course, Nanabush in the heat of the moment, stabs the Shibiji in the body. And so he lets out a big roar, and that's when the first flood happens. He floods uh, floods that world up, and Nanabush runs away. He runs on top of a, of a hill, and then the waters subside. So Nanabush uh, then realizes that, you know, I didn't, I didn't kill him. So he, he makes preparations and he makes that log, a raft. And then that's when he decides that he's, uh, he's walking around and he meets the, what they call Makkim Dimwe, old lady, to, old toad lady. And she's the one that's, uh, she has basswood bark on her back and she's going around singing and she's tying this basswood on tree to tree. And it's a, it's a good visual. It's like now, you, you know, when you watch war movies, eh, when they have these wires to trip a bomb and stuff. And, or even if you want to think of it now as the internet or whatever, all this wire, uh, basswood bark all over. So she's singing this song, and Nanabush uh, meets up with her, and he says, Oh, what are you singing? And she says, Oh, this is a song I, I sing when I do my doctoring. My uh, grandson that was wounded by Nanabush. She goes, maybe you're Nanabush. He says, no, I'm not Nanabush. Let me carry that ball of uh, basswood bark for you, and you can tie it. Okay, so they go along, and Nanabush says, oh, that's a nice song. I'd like to learn that. She goes, oh, well, just start singing along with me. So she teaches him that song. And then when she's done, then that's when he, he clubs her, clubs her over the head. Then he flays her, takes her skin, and then he puts it on. And now he ties those rattles that were on her ankles, and then he starts dancing and singing that same song. But she had told him that if Nanabush tripped on that rope, a big rock would come and smash him. And uh, so that's what people used to say, you know, sometimes you, you're driving by and there's a field and there's this big boulder out in the middle of nowhere. And then that's what they would say, oh, that's where Nanabush must have tripped that wire and got out of the way and a big rock came, landed. So Nanabush goes down and he knows that he has to go underwater to go meet, the, see that uh, Shibji that he stabbed. So and he goes down there and then that's when he uh, actually sees that. And uh, he stopped at different times, but he passes the way. But this time, when I'm, tell, I'm just telling the short version here. Then he, he gets in there, and he actually takes that spear out, and then he stabs that Shibji in the shadow. And this time he kills him. And as he's running out, he takes that uh, toad skin off, and then he ru starts running up the hill, and then that's the flood. So it wasn't the... In these versions, these other versions that are told, the flood actually happens, but not because the Creator is mad. Not because people are living um, ill or uh, bad or jujuebs okay, so they weren't living an evil life. It was the, the flood was because of the actions that the underwater middle took against Nanabush, and Nanabush got his revenge, and then that's when he then then the start the fl uh, that whole story starts up again, eh? About uh, of course Nanabush make, remaking the world. Uh, and so it's a recreation story. When we look at uh, different versions of these stories, put them together, then we can start looking at uh, getting a bigger understanding and looking for the meaning in the stories as well, the motifs. So the best, to me, what I've been working towards by working with uh, speakers is, and recording them is to try and get the flavor of the spoken word now. Because we do have the written versions, and then uh, which is fine, but the the thing is, if you actually have children at one point able to tell the story in our language with the same, using the same turns of phrase, and actually we're not we're not people that have used much intonation in our language to convey information, 
it's usually done with what they call emphatic particles. So that's what uh, we're, we're missing in our, in our language instruction. The other part is uh, that I think we're missing is we're, you listen to speakers talk and then they just change little things in one word and then they all start uh, laughing and they're just playing with the language because they're just twisting words, really. And that's the thing that we don't have in our language programs is the people don't, the students aren't taught the structure of our language. They're more taught phrases and uh, stock, what they call stock phrases. What's your Ganesh Kadodem? What's your clan? Apija Anjabayan. Where are you from? Anishaj Nakazian. And then uh, they do numbers and colors and, and then even get into foods and stuff. But then when you actually get talking about uh, the way a bird is flying or the way a fish is swimming, then that's where you would start to put words together differently. And uh, so we're just, I feel like we haven't gotten that far yet to actually, because our, our language is what they, they call agglutinative, and that means taking word parts together, morphemes, and sticking them in the appropriate place to make different meanings. And that's where the descriptiveness of our language lies, but we don't seem to teach that way. So do you think it's due to colonization or just the practices? To, you can't rule out colonization in, any, in anything, especially in education. But I think part of it is we... The other thing I think that uh, I think is happening is we end up saying that we have an Anishinaabe method of teaching language. But I don't think any... I've never seen anybody actually articulate it other than say that they were raised in it. But when you're raised in it, that isn't actually teaching it. And so they, people who say that I find are, are mixing... Uh, two things up, two different concepts up. If you learned it as a child, mm -hmm. you just, you, you acquired it. Yeah. You weren't taught it, per se. And so now when we're in schools, we're actually teaching it. And so when we're teaching a second language, there's a lot of second language methodologies out there. So, of course, one of the things is uh, communicative competence, where you're actually trying to get them to be able to communicate their needs. And so when you're doing that, per se, sometimes you don't necessarily get at the descriptiveness of the language because it's more functional. Mm -hmm. So to me, when you're just doing this functional stuff, that's one, one level. But then when you get past, if you master that functional level, then you get to the next level where you're actually getting more descriptive. Then that's where I think, I think we're just not... As a teacher, pedagogically, we're, we haven't gone to the next level. And so, to me, we're, how many, like, uh, I often talk about this, how many, if you go on YouTube, how many, how many lessons are there on colors, numbers, clans, and where you're from? Mm -hmm. Like, if you just go on YouTube and you say, Ojibwe, beginner Ojibwe, that's what you're going to find, like, just hundreds of the same thing. And it's like, well, how does somebody know, then, well, what's the next lesson? Nobody knows what the next lesson on these um, when you go on on the on the internet sometimes for for these I, I've seen recently that there's been a couple but there's no actual gradation to actually make have somebody progress through that so I think on the one hand yeah it's colonization because the but the other thing is I don't think we've had enough time as a people to really look at our language and our pedagogy and then to try and put the two to merge best practices of the two because even uh, I've seen <coughs> some people do a, immersion and they participated in immersion mm -hmm. and they they weren't getting anywhere uh, that I could see after a year in immersion as adults um, I didn't see that they had any uh, uh, significant appreciable acquisition of the Nishnab Emwin or even comprehension but um, that's changed now. There's a there's a young group of young people, one, and another fellow, uh, Brendan Fairbanks, who's leading out there in Minnesota, and then this other one group called Ojibwe Motadada, and I forget the young lady's name. I think it's Lucia Bonaccio or something like that. She's got an Italian last name, and and uh, but she runs this thing, 
Ojibwa Mo Tadada, and they're getting uh, young uh, adults speaking. Mm. And now, of course, uh, Jessica Shonyas, who was uh, used to be Jessica Benson, and Monty uh, Magaki and and the Squankut race, they're, they started a thing called the Shkindishnab Imjik, and they're getting somewhere. But why, to me, why they're getting somewhere is they actually were effectively able to use tools that people like Marianne Corbier made that ex actually explained our language. But to me, what was happening, and uh, I talked to one of the students who was getting somewhere before, and that's what they said was, uh, People, a lot of people, speakers especially, would say to them, these young, new speak, adult speakers, you you can't use uh, grammar. We don't want to use grammar to teach our language as a white man's way. Meanwhile, the ones that have actually gotten somewhere have an understanding of Nishnab M1 grammar. Mm -hmm. So there's this, so to me, two things that are happening there. One, the the adult fluent teachers don't really know, in a sense, or aren't properly trained as language teachers. And so they think that how they learned their language is going to be the same how we're going to learn as adults. But you can sit here and uh, they can talk to you till they're blue in the face and you ain't going to pick it up. Or if you, if you do, after significant hours, the 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 other going theory I think is that you spend seven thousand hours. So one program is doing this through summers, and they're keeping track of how many hours they've spent. And then I'd like to see their their charts after, because one guy did a report on them, and he said uh, when he went to that class in the summer, this immersion class, and he couldn't tell who was the first year entry and the fifth year because they are all weren't speaking Nishnabhema. And then when when the, the lead instructor went in and, and talked, he couldn't tell the guy who was uh, doing the evaluation of this, he couldn't tell who actually was comprehending. So he couldn't tell if, if you and I were sitting in there, mm -hmm. he couldn't tell if you were the first year or the fifth year, or if I was the first year or I was the fifth year. So. They, they, some really say, okay, it's just immersion. But to me, you got to use everything and anything. We all learn differently, and that's what I think isn't really being acknowledged by fluent speakers who become teachers. They don't really recognize that everyone learns differently. And so why some people may want to learn grammar is because they need to understand, in their own mind, they need to understand how this gets put together first before trying to speak it. So, and then others say that they don't need that, they just need to hear it. So one time I was at a, at a ceremony, and the ceremony maker's son was there, and so the ceremony maker is fluent, but his son isn't. So the son says to me, Nad mo shin. So I'm a, I'm a shkabeva, so I go running up to him and I go, Wanesh. And he goes, not motion. So I says, well, I go, Manesh. Then he points to somebody over across the way and he says, not motion. And I was like, oh. So what he wanted to say, really meant to say was, not the mo, help her. But he was saying, not motion, help me. Yeah. So he didn't know that that's, and that's the thing. When, when you hear the word, you think it, he thought it just means help not motion, but it actually means help me. And he didn't know to say not the more, help her or her. So that's the thing that's happening. We don't we don't know the 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 workings of it and when we add different things to it, so then we end up making mistakes and uh, and uh, although in the end he I understood him, but it took a it took a while. So that's kind of the thing that uh, grammar helps you teach that. Whereas he's, he's heard that word a lot, not emotion. Whether or not he heard not emo, uh, I don't know. Or even if he heard not emo wick, I don't know if he heard that either. Not emo again, not emo again, or any variation. I don't know if he, he knows all that. So, so that's the thing is, uh, to me, there's, there is uh, 
I don't know if, it, if bias is too strong a word, but uh, that if it, if it seems too much like a white man's thing, Nishnabe aren't going to use it, and uh, they'll they'll disparage it. Eh? That, uh, that's a white man's way. So one time I had to teach uh, Marianne's course at uh, Laurentian, and there was one Nishnabe. Well, uh, there was many Nishnabe students in there, but one guy. He obviously wasn't doing the work, but he'd show up to class. And so then he, he says to me, uh, this is my name. And he says, I bet you can't find that in any dictionary. And then uh, I was like, well, maybe you're right. I says, but I don't have any dictionaries on me right now. And then he, so he's like, and it means this. And then I was like, okay. So he wanted to challenge uh, that. Which is fine. That's a a classroom is meant to challenge and uh, ideas and stuff. Anyway, then uh, later, then he says, uh, "I'm not going to learn this way through writing. I'm going to learn through listening." I says, "Okay, that's." I said, "There's CDs there. You you you'll listen, and uh, you can you can do it." Then then of course. Uh, he quit. So I was, uh, I was like, well, I don't know. I'm not, uh, I'm not the one to make sure he stays in school. Eh? But it would be interesting to see now if he actually did listen and where he's gone with uh, with his language. So to me, I just think you gotta. I think people underestimate the complexity of our language, and they also underestimate the effort that is re acquire, required to acquire it. And uh, and then that's the the thing, and I think the other thing that happens is uh, we really don't thoroughly, if we adopt a, a methodology, a pedagogy, a second language acquisition, I find we don't implement it properly and fully. So to me, it's like um, the analogy I make is that we made a program at Lakeview School and it's structured and scaffolded. And I, I often thought if this were condensed and, and the immersion kids had to do this and had the immersion part, they would, they would actually get fluent quicker. But the way they're doing their immersion with the kids there, those kids aren't speaking because they're not made to speak, answer back in Nishnabem when. So they, they have a lot of comprehension, which of course is good, you need that. But they could be further ahead, eh? And it's because they, the, the teachers there have a reticence to use literacy. And it's this idea that immersion is just oral. So <clears throat> if you actually used a lot of different methodologies and actually tested them right out, then you would be able to tweak or say, here's where this, this one did work, but this one didn't. But we don't do that. And I, part of it is, like when you said colonization, part of it is funding. So it sounds, this this whole half hour here, maybe it sounds like I'm crapping over our speakers and our teachers and that, but uh, it, it isn't. Uh, we don't have the proper funding to actually look at methodology, test it out, evaluate it, and then make modifications. We're always just stuck in making new ones. And we actually haven't tested one out to this works because of X, Y, and Z, but A, B, and C didn't work. So I'm going to mo modify this and do it this way. So we, and then we end up just chasing all these new fads like uh, apps. And, uh, and then if you look at some of the apps, really, if you looked at the app, I, I've seen a couple of apps. I, I can't say I've seen them all. But it really is just the same of taking the, the old books that they had and looking at the numbers and colors and uh, and where are you from and what's your clan and what's your father's name and that. And, you know, that's all basic stuff that you need. But then it's like, okay, what's the next part? How are you outfitting the student to learn more and to become an independent learner? But they're really based on, again, what it, what's called the stock phrase method. You learn all these phrases and... And then that's where you get where you get people saying "nadmo shin" when they meet "nadmo," 
So that's the, the kind of thing that we, we, we may make apps, but we don't make them structured to go on to different levels. And, or, and they're generic. And it's not like, this is actually, I made this app for kids. Mm -hmm. And I want them to use it. And I made this one for teenagers. Yeah. And I made this one for adults. You know, there's, there, it's just, no, we're going to hit them all. Yeah. yeah, and so you end up with, um, so we made an app. We made two apps, actually. And, uh, and an immersion school out in uh, Minnesota actually wrote to us. And our app was uh, that Bobby Bow chart. Mm -hmm. And the intent, though, was to actually make it like a game. And when I was a kid, my buddy had a, a game called Simon Says. And it had four colors and four corners. And then it had, you had to repeat the patterns. So it would go green, green, blue, yellow, green. And so you had to keep that sequence going into the sequence so it would get longer. And you're so our app was actually using the syllable chart and then we had the syllables colored so they, those ending in long O were a specific color, those ending in long A were a different color so then it would generate this on the iPad and then the kids have to follow but really what they're learning because it would say, it wouldn't just go beep it would say de, bo, be yeah. you're learning all the different, the short vowel, the distinguish between short vowels and long vowels when you're playing that game and then the next phase of that game is and it's made a niche boggle. So they would say the word, and then you, you have all those syllables in a matrix, and then the kid had to pick out the, the sil right syllables to spell, spell the word. So it's like boggle, you find the, the words. So it was teaching them to spell. Then the next part was taking images of uh, actors, and actions and places, and then they had to make the sentence. So we had birds, sky, river, lake, road, uh, school, whatever, and then uh, and then crawling, flying, swimming, running, walking. So then they had to then pick the right words based on the the picket picture. So that one is currently being made. So it's actually trying to teach a different level, all, uh, a suite of a suite of apps. So again, but that being said, we're still very at, at the very beginning. The next phase that I, I made it at, was wanting to make, was uh, to actually have then uh, to tackle that, what I, what, what's called morphology, putting those word parts in, and then actually learning how, how to manipulate that. So one of the examples I often use is uh, Guy Webb To, he's running home. And then Kwan Webb To, he's running up the stairs. Nisan Webb To, running down the stairs. Bin De To, comes running inside. So Nim To, he's running away. Bij To. So then the kids end up learning. Yeah. yeah. So that's the stuff that we're not teaching. Yes. Yeah. And then you, you use those same things, and instead of saying Bato, you say biza. So bija biza comes flying in. Nim biza, he flies out. Giwe biza, he comes driving home. Mm -hmm. So you've learned how to put these together to make uh, make new words. And that that's the, the other part that we wanted to next phase of the app. The criticism of that is it's very Jagannash structural based on linguistics. And uh, so that's what uh, people have, have said to me about it, but uh, to me it's like, okay, what, what you're actually, what we're trying to teach them, how, we're, how we've been teaching the kids in the school now, thus far, hasn't worked. Part of it, a, lot, a big part of it, of course, is the amount of time spent on it, but the, to me the other part is effective and engaging activities, learning activities, as well as resources aren't there. So sometimes you still get a a black and white photocopy handout for for your work, and it's like uh, you know the whole school has iPads, but when you're doing Ojibwe stuff, it's still um, handwriting on, on the thing, paper. So there's a lot of room to to make things. 
So I, I just think that we what we we haven't been able to do yet is you know yes colonization happened, yes uh, school as an institution is a colonial institution, and but you know what we're 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 still taking over that, but we haven't really managed yet to say okay, this pedagogy. At some point, I guess, is colonial in some way, but at this point, we can actually appropriate it for our own means. And now you look at people like I met uh, a guy from Wiki. He's uh, he's doing. Uh, he was in Scotland and he was doing. Uh, I think he was a biochemical uh, engineer. And it's like, well, somebody would go around and say, well, he's a uh, he's a uh, colonized. <laughs> Yeah, and it's like he didn't learn anything off the land. And, <laughs> you know, meanwhile, I'm like, I'm really proud of this guy. I don't even know him. Yeah. And I'm like, yeah, there's an Anishinaabe biochemical engineer. And uh, and then there's others that are doctors, like uh, Rani Wakagijik's daughter there, Anna, Anna Lynn. Yeah. And I'm like, uh, I'm proud of her. Uh, and But then people are like, you just hear people very simplistically say that, you know, we got to learn to live off the land. And it's like, yeah, we do, but there's so much more to our world, too. That, and not everyone not everyone wants to live in the bush. Somebody wants to watch Netflix, <laughs> you know? Or have new nails. <laughs> yeah. So it's, uh, yeah. I just find it interesting because um, that I noticed, like, when I did my university, I did a college language course. I did a university, I think, two years and that was a little stressful time and it's getting like a rash like compared to all my other oh, yeah. courses I thought that was the toughest one and I think it had to do with some kind of emotional things I was carrying like oh why didn't I learn this yeah. you know I was going through all that but then I find myself that I'm able to understand more like uh, just the way I guess uh, I was taught you know, or if I hear someone speaking it, yeah. and then I'll, I'll either tell them to slow down a bit, yeah. and then I'll catch, like, it's almost ingrained day, so yeah. I'll be able to understand more, or sometimes it depends, eh? So I just find it interesting. Like, but it, I've always hear, I've always heard it, or yeah. I've always, and then I've kind of repeated it in my mind, and then that will help me, Yeah. you know, comes time to actually say something, or when I'm reading it, it'll help me, like, both ways. You're, you're right, uh, and I just got reminded of that, what you, what you talked about. Uh, and Marianne was telling me before that uh, the same kind of thing, that people end up really having a strong reaction sometimes to her course, because they, if they fail especially. Mm. And, uh, but then others, uh, I know one lady from Chiging, she goes, oh, that ever easy. Is <laughs> you're just learning patterns, you're just... It's just like, and but what Marianne found was people that were in sciences and uh, maths yeah. found that really easy. Yeah. Cause all it really yeah. is all just a formula. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And all you're doing yeah. is making the appropriate, yeah. uh, slotting in the appropriate yeah. information. But she said people in the arts just couldn't wrap their head around that, and uh, they had a hard time doing it. They they do excellent in their social work courses and stuff and and theory. But then you get to actually just plugging in, where does the past tense prefix go? They put it at the end, or, you know, <laughs> not that bad, but you know, yeah. <laughs> yeah, yeah, but you know, it, depends, eh? yeah, it yeah, and, it, and that's the thing, again, getting back to this, uh, people learn differently. Yeah. So when you mentioned that you, you'd had a rash in that, what Mary and I, Marianne and I, not just Marianne and I, but others had talked about was, uh, when people talk about this cultural competence and then uh, all the amount of shaming now that goes on with language. Like, it, it used to be worse, it doesn't seem as bad anymore, but let's say 10 years ago, there was this real, maybe I just haven't, maybe I just stopped seeing uh, the people that I know say this, but if you don't speak your language, you're not true Anishinaabe. You must have heard that, eh? Yes. Yeah, and that, about 10 years ago, that was, uh, the big uh, supposed motivator, and of course they call that a negative motivator. And then of course when you're, when it's negatively motivation, it's like you're not Anishinaabe enough, and then you're trying to sort this out and get an A, and you're failing. Then it's like, 
I'm already not Nishnabe. Now I can't even do it. I'm even worse. So it it isn't building up. It isn't building up your identity. So I read the RCAP Royal Commission on Aboriginal People, and uh, Ivan Ivan Eber put together a, a report that I really liked, and it was called the State of Aboriginal uh, Language Instruction in Canada. So she wrote all to all the First Nations. And she asked them to send in information of their their education philosophy, their language philosophy, and any of their language resources that they had, and and lessons and lesson plans and all this. So she analyzed that. And one of the things that she found, and this I think is still true, is that all of their language uh, or education statements, their mission statements, were that we are going to teach the language so that the people will have a, a strong identity as Nishnabe people or whatever nation they are. That was the, the intent. And then what she, I think she's a she, Yvonne could be a man too. Anyway, uh, she says, but, but when you look at all of their resources, it's very grammatical and structuralist in nature. It actually isn't made to foster identity development, especially if you're learning grammar rules. That doesn't actually foster the development of an Anishinaabe identity, is what she was saying. So she says, basically, the goals of the program are socio identity, social identity, but the actual tools and means used to do that are grammatical structuralist. So she's basically saying you got to change that, make it more in line with what the goals are. Yeah, because that's one of the things too that I found hard, well, that is that, okay, well you show me a word, but I need to have it broken down so I could understand it more and visualize it, yeah. not just one word and, okay, that's what it is. Yeah. No, but I want to know how, you know what I mean? Yeah. So I find that in resources, they don't break down those words or they don't um, depict a visualization, eh? And it's all written. So I think more of that should be, that could be done and it would help people like visual learners or... Yeah. I think that would, you know, make progress in learning. So that's the, the thing is, uh, what I think is, on the one hand, the other thing is, I think, now the Anishinaabe say stuff like, um, well, we adapted to the world all the time. But now there seems to be this uh, kind of undercurrent or sometimes unsaid thing of not taking white man's pedagogy in teaching, especially teaching language. And like 20 years ago, the elders I used to talk to would actually say stuff like, um, don't teach a white man your language because then they'll turn around and be teaching it back to you. So that's the same kind of sentiment, that I think, and this is part of the colonization thing, whereas and uh, uh, structures of power in knowledge making, where it's, uh, you don't want to give that to the white man because then that, that they turn around and say, no, that's wrong. But what, we, what we're doing now is we're actually, you see where the, these younger people are having success in it, and they actually have used what linguistics has offered, and they're getting further ahead. So to me, if you base it actually, if you actually did a study on who's acquiring language and how they're doing it, you'll actually see that they've used a lot of grammatical, structural materials and then made it on their own as independent learners, made it towards their social identity. But when you're dealing with kids, they're not independent learners yet per se. So you have to actually provide that for them, eh? So what I try to advocate is that we actually look at the whole field of teaching and take the best and try and incorporate it. But there seems to be, to me, uh, an inherent bias that, no, we're going to do it on our own. And sometimes it's like, somebody already figured this out somewhere else in the world. Let's use it. But uh, there, there just seems to be this, no, it's not Anishinaabe, that's not a Anishinaabe way of doing it and then they just kind of close the door on it. So I, I've, seen, I've seen that happen, and I, what I really hope happens is we get a more of an open-mindedness as Anishinaabe people, and it would be, to me, this of course is apples and oranges, but it's like saying, uh, no, I'm not going to take nylon, nylon net 
because it's not traditional. When I go set a net, I'm going to use just natural fibers to catch fish. And it's like, uh, it's way easier and more durable and it lasts longer to use this nylon net. But it, it seems like, I don't really, I never heard any fishermen say that, but that's the analogy I think of it <laughs> as with, with teachers, yeah. yeah. Like, no, I'm not going to use that nylon net. I'm going to use the, the vegetal fiber one, the, the cedar bark, and you know, and that's what we're going to use for the catch fish. And I'm not, I'm not going to use a gun. I'm going to use a bow and arrow, and it ain't going to be fiberglass, uh, fiberglass bow or fiberglass arrows or even a crossbow. It's going to be made of hickory, you know, and that's what we're going to use to, to do it because it's more traditional. And it's like, as a tool, right? yeah, yeah, as a tool. And to me, that's what I look at these resources and the pedagogy and uh, methodology as tools. You can still use the tools, but from an indigenous frame of mind and, and indigenous goals, your own goals to achieve your goals. But uh, I think we get we get some of these things mixed up. So I went and did a workshop <coughs> there two weeks ago at an immersion program. And uh, they got uh, great instructors there. Anyway, so <coughs> the, I did two days, and I wanted to use what, this uh, methodology that we're using with um, uh, Lakeview to try and show them maybe if you mastered this, maybe this would, you know, conceptually, if you got this, you'd be able to go further ahead. So I, I was learning guitar to play guitar a while ago. And then one of my buddies says, once you get that F chord, and there's this, you know, you could play the F chord a, a certain way, but if you played it a different way, then he, he said, and then others actually said this after, then every other chord is uh, way easier. And it was almost like that. If you're able to get that magic one, then all the rest becomes easier. So I was saying to them, I said, sometimes we, our language, of course, is divided into four main verb types. And often what we do is we just focus on one verb type and teach that. And then go and move on, add another one verb type and teach that. And I said, but our language actually isn't, and we don't speak like that, just in one quadrant, you know. I know we got to go slow on that, but. So I said, but if you actually learned that there's three types of verbs that actually mean the same, uh, have the same meaning, and if you're able to learn to differentiate between those and, and understand them, then I think your learning would go further and faster. So the example I used there was uh, for the senses. So it says three of these verbs would be like, uh, first one would be wabe, mm -hmm. and that's just the act of seeing. And then wabman, he sees him or her. And then wabandan, he sees it. So if you had those three and you learn to differentiate them, then the same thing. Non dum, he hears. Non dwa, he hears him or her. And then non dan, he or she hears it. If you learn those three and you kept applying those, I thought maybe you'll be actually able to catch on to something quicker. Eh? And it's kind of it is kind of a getting that either that F chord, eh? where you're not going to get that F chord right away. You you have you do have to practice with the C and the G first and and get your finger fingers nimble enough. So the same thing you you do have to practice conjugating different verbs and specific uh, verb types. Mm -hmm. But if you actually then are able to put those together and then make the distinction later and make the right choices, then I think your language learning will go further. Was what I was saying. Mm -hmm. But back to the psycho psychological uh, issue. So we were doing our exercise, and when I was using foods, because, uh, you know, everyone talks about, uh, everyone has to talk about food, so I wanted it to be something you'd use every day. And so <coughs> with the thing we were talking about where I was using berries, because, you know, uh, the, one of the big contradictions is that strawberry is inanimate, and everyone wants it to be animate, because uh, it's a hard berry, eh? but it's inanimate. And same with blueberry. But uh, raspberries and blackberries are animate. Mm -hmm. 
So anyway, you, you, you would use different verbs based on that. And that's what I was telling them. First thing you see, you know you're going to talk about something, you have to decide if it's animate or inanimate. Then that affects the next choice of verb you're going to make, and then how you're going to describe that, and whether or not you're doing something to it, or if you're just describing it. So for instance, if you had the strawberry, you, you know, you decide it's animate, inanimate, I mean. Then you're going to say, is it it's red, or you're going to say it's delicious, or it smells good, or you're going to say, I'm going to eat it, or that you like the taste of it, or that you're going to store it, you know. So then you have all these different choices to make. But all those same verbs you'd use would be different when you're talking about a raspberry, because it's animate. Anyway, the, the young lady, she missed the first day, then she came in the next day. And so we were doing a different exercise, so I made these cards where I had the verbs, the animate form of the verbs, and the inanimate on the other side. So you had to choose, you had this little card, and you go up to the berry, and you would say whether you make the right choice, like, so you're going to say Gishmina Don or Gishmina Na. And then you're going to say uh, Maba or Manda. So you had to put these down. Anyway, so I gave everyone these cards. And then I says uh, to her, I knew she wasn't there the day before, I says, do you know all these words? Yeah, I know all these words. I says, oh, okay, so you're right to go up. Because I was getting them all to come up to the middle of the class and do this thing. Eh? And then she, she cracked. She just got really mad and was saying, this is stupid. And uh, I don't know why we're learning all these language. Uh, all these different dialects. I don't want. You, I hate dialects. I don't want to learn dialects. And, and then later on, then she left, and she was. Of course, everyone. Just, it just went real quiet, eh, and got awkwardly silent. And then later on, then she was, she was crying and stuff. And and then the instructor said, hey, "He's just trying to help you." But then, I, and I was like, "Wow." You know, if you showed up, the you know, and the. And then that was the thing, is she, the instructor came and talked to me after, and I said, no, she, she hardly show, she shows up once in a while, and, you know. Oh, okay. So, and it's, but still, it, it, like you said, it's a hard thing, but, uh, yeah. and then, so, I, me, I knew I didn't do anything wrong, uh, per se, and that uh, I guess I could have, I didn't know how to either console her or stop, you know, and stop the whole class, and, and then one of my friends said that, well, do you start with a circle and stuff? And I was like, no, I think the, they're, the people that are there are supposed to do that as, as part of their, if they're going to do that. And the elder actually, that's part of that class, actually did, did her job well and went consoled her and stuff. And I says, but there I'm delivering content. Mm -hmm. and, and that, I says, uh, if we went, went into a circle then, it would have probably ate up the rest of the day. And at the end of the day, she's to me, she's the only one that needed that, per se. Maybe she didn't even need it. But uh, the others were actually getting, start, it was starting to click, the, the lesson that I was imparting. And I thought, either do we set a step aside for one, or do we all try to go and forge ahead with the rest? And I said, well, in my mind, I was already, I was already like, well, okay, we're going to go, keep going ahead. So, so that's the kind of thing that uh, different, different teachers have a different perspective on. Like some would say, no, we got to, it's all for one, one for all. And then uh, me, I'm like, you're in a college program, you're an adult. Yeah, and you know, sure there are li other life things going on, yeah, yeah but uh, you know, at the end of the day, still, you, you do have to, you're an adult, I guess. Well, I continue. But it can be traumatizing yeah. to people, yeah. And and it's because of that, I think, is not only do have our elders said that, but actually there's actually this societal thing, too, that you if you don't speak your language, and uh, or if you're not dark, either. You know, you're fair. You're a fair Anishinaabe, and you're, you're not going to... You have it compounded, basically, sometimes. Eh? Anyway, uh, so there's a lot of different things going on. But uh, when the elders uh, the elders were saying, you're not Anishinaabe if you can't speak your language, I don't say that because I'm just like, I'm damning 
and uh, condemning my own children and grandchildren to whatever uh, adjective people say. Like some now say you're descendants of Nishnabe people instead of being Nishnabe people. And I'm like, huh? Yeah, you see, you hear, you hear that kind of stuff, yeah. So anyway, um, I'm like, no, I don't, I don't want to say that, uh, condemn them. So there's a lot of different things that uh, I think we need to be a bit more open-minded in a sense and try different things. But the other thing, this was, I guess, one of my last points was when we made this program at uh, Lakeview, I knew a couple of people uh, would say, that thing's doing nothing anyway. And uh, part of it is this buy-in. Eh? If you don't have people's buy-in, and the other thing is when they don't actually test it fully out. So it's like uh, I say to people, like they'll say, ah, this diet sucks, so I quit. And it's like, you're just two weeks into it. <laughs> How do you know it sucks? And then the same yeah. thing with a workout thing, you know? Yeah. yeah. Ah, this workout thing. Yeah, <laughs> yeah, this treadmill sucks. <laughs> and it's like, you didn't even test it right out. You got to stick with it for, yeah, yeah a, a while and test it right out before you throw it out. But I find we just throw, throw it all out right away. And then start to make a new one and say, yeah, I'm going to do this this time. And it's really the same thing, just different uh, different bells and whistles on it. But really it's the same thing. It's like they, they have a bike, a pedal bike, and then they put on a new different bell and a horn instead of actually getting a motorized bike they think they got a new model but really it's still just a pedal bike you know and it's uh but they just put on you know those things those flags yeah, or, well, uh, some, like sometimes they'll say is that you'll get tested to see how far you go or yeah. where your heart's at eh? yeah so it depends on how you want to push yourself and yeah be stronger eh? my my goal with that language program so we have our elders, like I said, back to translating those petitions and treaties, so privileging our version of what happened on the island and of, of those treaties. <coughs> and then what I wanted them to, the students to do, I said, I don't think they're going to be fluent, but what I, my goal is by the time they get to grade 8, they should be able to read this and uh, decode it, and when you decode something, that means you're just able to pronounce it right. And then they should be able to paraphrase it and then also glean different information from it. But they they won't necessarily be able to think their own thoughts on it. But if they, to me, I, I said that the success would be if they take our, if they came and they wrote a report all in Ojibwe about what the treaty was and what the Anishinaabe view of it was, in all the Nishnabe, then I would I would have considered that a, a a success of that program, even if they weren't able to do it without paper. So, if the, of course, the ultimate thing is if they were able to do that all without writing, and just mm -hmm. yeah, think it and do it. But uh, that's what would be a whole immersion program. But and then that's the other thing that's funny is. Uh, these these immersion programs seem to be like, uh, no, you don't need reading and writing. And they say the Maori did it. And then whenever they say that, I've, I've, I've gone to a number of talks that Maori, Maori people have done. And they all said that what was critical to their success was having a writing system. And that their immersion programs used reading and writing. And I don't know where some of our immersion instructors got the idea that Immersion means no reading and writing, and uh, like so they could actually still be doing immersion by reading a script, and they do a play together, and it's all written in Nishnabe and what. That's still immersion, but for some reason, some like no, that's um, you got to memorize the the whole lines and it's like, but that's not uh, and then looking at different. Uh, so they do start doing different, using different written stuff, but it just doesn't seem that it's uh, a real engagement with literacy per se for expression.
using literacy for self-expression in Nishnabe and what whereas it's mostly still people have to the teacher writes down and then the students copy and that to me is that's a stage but the next stage is where the student then looks for information somewhere and then incorporates it and creates their own expression in their language yeah so that was what we were shooting for with our with our program but it all gets at the end of the day, it all gets down to political agendas too, so that program is being sunsetted at the end of June. Two years ago, a review was done of it, and it had a good a good review. So now they're going to, uh, uh, it looks like it's going to just get uh, set elsewhere. So, But part of it is, uh, I feel like um, we had a good five years to, to prove what we were able to do, and we had a couple of good... Uh, instances, but it, in and of itself it wasn't going to save the language either. But um, it would go, I think it would go to to having a more challenging and sophisticated Ojibwe Nishinaabe when programming. That would have been uh, what the goal was, a second language program. So a lot of people think uh, if you're teaching Nishinaabe when as a subject and trying to use immersion techniques, and your class is, uh, let's say, one class is 30 minutes. So you're trying to teach immersion to students for uh, 90 minutes a week. That ain't going to work. They're not going to retain anything if you're just trying to use an immersion style, per se, or and it, where it's just orality, or it's just oral language. They're not going to retain it because it's just, there's just not enough time for that. But if you expanded the amount of time dedicated to hearing the language and using it, then, then that would work. But not using immersion for thir three 30 minute classes. So you actually have to change your your method, uh, your pedagogy. So, like, I, I, I think I talked about how I, how I maybe I'm s be seen as a conservative in the sense that um, to me, the lodge is the lodge and the school is the school. There is a place in between that can be used both. Uh, there is some where the two would inform each other. But I think uh, largely I don't like to see uh, the school being conceived or perceived or staged as the lodge. Yeah. And to me it comes back to this, what I was talking about earlier, when that old man talked about program, that uh, if it then gets in the school, I think of that then as a program. And I always thought, maybe again, maybe I'm wrong, but I I always thought that one of our most basic teachings was uh, choice and free will. But when you when you uh, put it in school, to me, and maybe I just got a Catholic ha hangover. When I went to school, when I was going to school, we had religion. And we had to take uh, First Communion and uh, Confirmation and and Confession, Penance and all this. Mm -hmm. And it wasn't optional. So I just see that as uh, the, the, the worst case scenario, that that kind of happens again. Eh? Where people start saying, you have to do this, you're not Anishinaabe enough if you don't do this. And I think that uh, our society now is uh, more diverse and that uh, we do want to have our our way of life uh, maintained and maintained and uh, strengthened and that's happening but now I'm starting to see a shift I was just talking to uh, talking to my wife there I said I'm starting to see a shift where the people that I used to go to ceremonies with before were saying you can't do the ceremonies without language you can't address the spirit in English but now I'm I'm starting to see, and this is just on looking uh, trolling Facebook that uh, people are starting to say, no, uh, the spirit talks to me. And another guy had phoned me, and he says I'm being directed by spirit. And uh, so everyone, uh, I was like, now that's one of the big things that used to egg people on to learn the language was that uh, ceremonies had to be done and conducted in Nishinaabe. But now it seems like that's starting to loosen up. 
people are now saying, no, no, uh, we've been doing this ceremony in English for X amount of years now, and it's brought healing, and it's brought uh, uh, good feelings for people. And it's like, well, that, I guess that is hard to argue with, that the result of that ceremony is to bring healing and good feelings and a sense of uh, brotherhood and sisterhood, then it's accomplished its goal. And you did that all without Nishnabhimun. And to me, I just see that as uh, part of the uh, the sinking, that our, our impetus for learning it, 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 it takes another blow. And I, I, I've said this, uh, I used to say this all the time, but I'm confident our ceremonies are going to last 30 years from now. Somebody's still going to be doing ceremonies. It's quite a lot. In our area, I'm not as confident that that ceremony is going to be conducted in Nishnabhimun at this point, and 40 years from now, even, as well. So that's, that's what I see happening, is that the protocol and the order of procession of the ceremony will be preserved, and even maybe even some of the songs, but the actual invocation and communication will be done in English. And one of the other things I was at, my, my aunt passed away a while ago, and that uh, I brought that old man to her wake. And when uh, this was, they finished a church service, and so then they, they brought a big drum. And so these guys came and they sang a song on the big drum. And so they said, stand uh, for an honor song. And so I, I, me and the old man and another Shkabeus are at the back. And that old man, he just stays sitting. So I was going to stand up, but then I was like, well, I, I don't know, I'll, I'll, I'll sit down too. So so I sat there with the old man and then the other helper just sat there and everyone else is standing up. And then the, that old man, he's listening to that song and he says to me, they don't even know what they're singing. He says, that's my song. That's the song we sing when we bring that, that Sundance tree in. And he says, but they don't know that. That's what that that's what that is when you're carrying that tree in. This is what they call it an honor song. So, to me, I, I, that always struck me because I thought, you know, these songs will will stay, but uh, some of them they might know the words, but some might not know the context or the teaching behind it. And then others sometimes you hear them singing the song, and it's the words they're singing. It's like I don't know what you're saying, and then they tell you what what they what they think they're saying, and it's like, and all I just say at that point is, oh, it must be a dialect thing. <laughs> <laughs> but it's uh, it's like it doesn't uh, you mis you mispronounce yeah. yeah yeah, so and they're they're not speakers so it's like, uh, but they're like no this is the way I learned it and this is, and I'm like. I'm sure whoever taught you it, you know, said it a different way. I said that too for just yeah. a couple weekends. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. Almost yeah. a different dialect. Yeah. So it, it's, uh, I don't know. That's the, that's the thing. Uh, <clears throat> so that's why part of it, again, is uh, if you have people that learned in the lodge from the lodge people, and then I don't know that drum group where they learned that song from. And then the other thing is, here, this one song, <laughs> I shouldn't say I hate it, but uh, it's, uh, they say it's a water song, eh? Oh, okay. And they sing, When They Yaho. And, it, and it's, you hear it everywhere. And it's like, and then, so one, one lady, uh, we were doing the program, and I says, why don't you sing a Mishnabe one? Because that's supposed to be a Mi'kmaq one, eh? Mm -hmm. She goes, no, that's, we can't change it. That's how we learned it. So I was like, okay, I says, well, for our program, though, we want to learn words. You know, we just change the words. And she goes, no, that's how we learned it. You're not supposed to change the song, which is true. Then I was like, okay. So I thought she learned this from an elder, this song. Anyway, so I talked to another woman in that singing group she's part of. I said, Where'd you, who'd you learn that song from? Oh, uh... Dora had a CD, and we play that on the CD, and we sing along. 
And I was like, what? And you can't change that? <laughs> and he learned it from a CD, not a, you know, you mean it. The other lady made it sound like he's learned from a sacred dog, grandmother from Mi'kmaq country that was on a sacred purpose to bring it here, you know. And uh, so that just blew my mind that uh, maybe I'm sounding real negative. But anyway, uh, I just think of these these things as, well, you know, they had their time and place. And I look at it as kind of like uh, when we still sing Twinkle, Twinkle, Little Star in Nishnabim, when it, it had its place, but now we should be beyond that, but we're not. We're still singing Twinkle, Twinkle, Little Star, and she'll be coming around the mountain, and uh, I know Ojibwe. And there, they, there could be good for teaching, like the Wabim Skadabon Go Bidavushin, like that's uh, it's a fun thing to sing in that, eh? But I just think it had its time. Like we, we should be using our own more culture-based teachings from our area and our own song. Whenever you're learning somebody else's, you're privileging that over your own. And that to me is the, the that's the colonization part as well. And it, part of it is the result of that colonization is because our, our knowledge were diminished, devalued, as well as uh, outlawed and banned. And so people didn't, uh, didn't uh, keep it going because of that. Only certain sects did they, uh, certain pockets here and there. But now that that's been removed, there's really no need to keep singing. Should be coming around the mountain, or Twinkle Twinkle Little Star, or or Forever Jaka in Nishnabim. So anyway, they those were when I was a kid. Those were the songs used when I was a kid, and and it still kind of uh, amazes me that we we haven't moved beyond that in a sense.